So thank you for this invitation. It's always a pleasure to be back to the Newton Institute of Cambridge. I saw took my swap and I saw cricket scoring boards. <laughs> so, uh, so since this is the first talk of this conference and uh, there are the two topics mentioned, uh, quantum entropy of black holes and quantum information theory in chemical uh, So I thought that I will speak about both. And in fact, there are quite interesting results on both that I, can, I would like to report on. One of them has been work, uh, so, the part one I will discuss, I would say quite very striking progress since over a decade in computing exact quantum entropy of certain supersymmetric black holes, including all perturbative and non-perturbative corrections to the bekenstein hopping entropy in very precise agreement with integral. So you first of all, you get an integer after doing a path integral, which is kind of surprising because path integral is not naturally a complex analytic object. You get an integer out of it. Uh, and it matches exactly with some very non-trivial numbers that you get number theory. It's a non-trivial interplay between topics in number theory like modular forms, radar marker expansion, Kluster and sums, and topics in field theory, localization, with equivalent localization in supergravity, chance science theory, and so on. <clears throat> and there are also, uh, this is, some of this I had talked about a few years ago here, but there have been actually quite substantial and steady progress over the years, you know, quite recently. And some of the issues which were a bit unclear uh, were much better understood now. So there are many recent developments and interesting relation to SYK model, which I will briefly mention. In the second part, I will discuss the quantum entanglement entropy in quantum field theory and in string theory, primarily with motivations from black hole physics, information paradox, generalized second law thermodynamics, holography, for generic non supersymmetric black holes. And there, have, there are some recent results that I will report to define uh, the classical and quantum uh, entanglement entropy in string theory using this orbifold method, which is like a generalization of the FDK methods. And present arguments which show that the entropy is so defined as finite, which is of crucial importance. Essentially, because uh, if you can think of a black hole, and if you trace out the internal degrees of freedom of a black hole, then in quantum field theory, the entanglement entropy is infinite because of this area divergence. And if that were really the case, it would mean that the black hole has an infinite number of qubits, and it can store arbitrary amount of information. So showing the finiteness of entanglement entropy in a consistent quantum theory of life is really a fundamental question. Now, why should we be interested in exact quantum entropy of black holes? And by exact quantum entropy, I really mean the generalization of Dickinson Hawking entropy, including all corrections. So, Dickinson Hawking formula is area over four, but you can have corrections which are one upon the area, log of the area, e to the minus the area, all measured in Planck units. Uh, so, this can be a very stringent constraint on the consistency of string theory, because even though we don't know whether string theory is true or not true experimentally, uh, this is a kind of a constraint which can rule out string theory, because even if it's not a realistic black hole, if, because we expect that any black hole in any compactification of string theory should be interpretable as an ensemble of quantum states. This is a very generic, uh, requirement. Any thermodynamic system should have a statistical mechanical interpretation. And if that failed in any one of the compactifications for any one of the black holes, that would show that there is something wrong with string theory. So it's a little bit like uh, we, it's a little bit like H2O has a H2O, some fundamental Hamiltonian that exists in many phases. And string theory is a bit like that. That's a fundamental thing that we don't really understand. We only understand its phases, different compactifications. So if we can find some universal and stringent constraint that is valid in all phases, that's a useful thing to do. 
In particular, this requires us to calculate finite size corrections to the black hole entropy. So finite size meaning area is finite. That's why one upon area or into the minus area. The Wilkinson Hawking calculation is really valid in the infinite area limit, in the large area limit. And this is really connects to the broader problem of quantum holography of finite end. So holography has been around for several years now, but most of the calculations are really in super gravity to study large and behavior of strongly coupled behavior of quantum field theories. But if you would really like to understand something about quantum gravity, you really have to study the finite end effects. And this relates to the question is quantum gravity emergent or dual? And these are the kinds of motivations to study exact quantum entropy. And it looks like actually a very difficult problem, but it, it will turn out that various methods of localization and supergravity, which were developed in the last 10 years or so, provide us novel tools to deal with non perturbative quantum effects. Uh, Pish, sorry. What, can you elaborate a bit more what you mean by emergent? Yes. Yeah, I will uh, come to it in the end after I have presented all the evidence. And then I will make a comment okay. rather than just give you. I, yeah. I just want to understand the difference between emergent and dual. That, that. So I think some people think that uh, really the gauge theory is fundamental and quantum gravity is emergent. In fact, the extreme point of view was that okay, any conformal field theory defines a consistent quantum gravity. And that I was always bothered by this because I thought that the quantum gravity was a hard problem. How could it be that this takes some dirty quantum field, quantum field theory and declare that this is quantum gravity? So I think where I, I believe that EDSCFT should be viewed as an exact holography, it could do a dual description rather than gravity being emergent. Okay, I will comment on that later. So I think uh, uh, I have worked actually with some of the organizers of this, in particular Samir, and I mentioned Samir because I just talked to him last night, uh, also with Suresh Nampuri, but I will mostly focus on the work done with these, uh, in fact, the, the first three people, a little bit of what we did with Simon Zagier, but there is a really a large number of people whose work is uh, implicated in this, and I. Uh, I won't be very careful in my referencing and giving them talk, but they are all references. If your name doesn't appear, we can put it there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how do we even define quantum entropy? So we know Beckins and Hawking formula is area contour. You know how to calculate. How do we calculate quantum entropy of black holes? I mean, that sounds like, and this became possible because of holography. If you look at a near horizon of a supersymmetric black hole, it has an ADS2 cross S2 factor. So there is an ADS2 first two terms, and then there is an S2. And then the problem using that symmetry of the problem, ADS2 cross S2, it's a homogeneous space. You can see that the field strengths have to be just constants like that. So your problem just reduces to a bunch of constants, L square, X star, and the classical problem. Uh, and there is this attractive, I mean, so there is a big simplification by exploiting this symmetry. And then one can apply usual roots of holographic correspondence, keeping in mind some of the important peculiarities of ADS2. So ADS2 CFT1 holography, I mean, it's like ADS5 CFT4 holography, but it has some special features which are, which are actually very important for this. So basically, ADS2, uh, Euclidean ADS2 is a Poincare disk, and it has infinite volume, so you have to put a cutoff. And the boundary CFT1 is just uh, zero dimensional quantum mechanics. Sorry, one dimensional quantum mechanics, but with Hamiltonian is equal to zero because it has to be uh, uh, conformally invariant. So trace C is zero implies Hamiltonian equal to zero. So it's a finite dimensional Hilbert space with a zero Hamilton. So it looks like a very trivial thing. And that dimension of the Hilbert space is just a number. And in fact, all the physics of the black hole goes into determining that number. So if you give a black hole with some particular degeneracy, which depends on its electric and magnetic charges, Q and P, 
then that number, which is oftentimes a Fourier coefficient of some modular form, that number is all the information that you have are left with once you go near the horizon. And the reason is simple, actually, because typically there is a gap. For example, if you look at the Strominger of Asa Black Holes, they have some left moving string and they excite it. So you are only looking at some number of states and there is a gap. So your area is to focus is on just this set of states and the number of those states is all the information that is left. The question is that, so this looks like almost a trivial thing, but it's highly non-trivial from the bulk point of view. So the ZCFT, it just trace it to the minus two pi R not H and it is just a number. Can we define correspondingly the partition function in the bulk? So we know that typically we have ZCFT is equal to Z, uh, what is it, ADL. So this is just a number. How do we define this? Now there is some peculiarity because of the fact that uh, you need to introduce a Wilson line just to make the variation problem well defined, you know, like you put the given sorting term. So if you have a Maxwell theory, you put this uh, variation problem that, that leads to a boundary term. So which looks like a Wilson line inserted on the boundary of ADS. Apart, apart from that, we just follow the same rules of holographic normalization. You can add boundary terms, which are local, et cetera, et cetera, to the norm wise. And you can define, therefore, a path integral of the, and I call it W for Wilson line and not Z, because there is an insertion of this Wilson line on the boundary, where Q are the electric charges of the black hole. And the magnetic charges of the black hole are already gone into defining the size of the H2 and size of the ADS. Now, so the prescription is, you should perform now a path integral over all string fields with an insertion of the Wilson line with appropriate boundary conditions and normalization. And this should reduce to the beckenstein hawking wall entropy for large QP. And quantum holography would require that WQP should be equal to DQP. So that's the statement of the problem. So what do we want to do? We want to show, so the, WQP is on the bulk side, if you like. There is a black hole with some charges Q and P. There is a quantum entropy, which I just defined. The near horizon is ADS2. And it's related to quantum geometry. And on the right-hand side is basically quantum mechanics. This is really general relativity and quantum mechanics. DQP is some number of bound states of the brain. You have to do some counting of states. And there is a CFT. There is a Hilbert space, and it's a basically a quantum generalization of Bekenstein Hawking agreeing with Boltzmann entropy. And the question is, can we compute both sides? And this uh, 20 years ago would have looked like a very uh, revealing my jokes. Anyway. <laughs> uh, 20 years ago, it would have looked like a, almost an impossible, crazy thing to do. Why? We even try to, to attempt. Uh, but as I will explain, uh, you can actually solve this problem on both sides for some simple systems. And uh, so, but to do that, you really have to leave the comfortable zone of uh, quantum field theory and venture into the treacherous zone of quantum gravity, where the rules are a little bit not well defined, and we have to figure out as we go along. So it's a little bit like the uh, Dungeons and Dragons game, that it's like a video game, you have to walk a very delicate path and make some, follow your nose. But if you jump too much on the left-hand side, then you're, you're finished and you die. If you jump too much on the right-hand side, you know, also finish. And once in a while, you en encounter some dragons, and you need some magic sword to slay the dragon. And if you succeed in doing it, then you discover a pot of gold. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to tell you because there are really, this uh, problem is really infested with dragons. And I just want to tell you <laughs> what are the dragons and what are the magic swords. So as I said, just to define what do we mean by, what is the corresponding quantity that we should compute? corresponding to DQP, corresponding to degeneracy. 
was already a very hard problem. I mean, it, and it required works of several years. Ward, for example, generalized defense and Hoffman to begin with, to include higher derivative corrections in the action. But then Sen was the one who gave this definition by including non-local effects, because in general, you can have determinants. And they are not summarized by local action. If you have determinants of massless fields. So you really needed some properly defined quantity before you even begin this comparison. And that problem was solved with the work of several people over 15, 20 years. Then counting of DQP is already a very hard problem. It requires deep brains, duality. And in many very interesting cases, that problem was solved. I and mean, going back to Sominger and Wafa and also earlier, uh, yeah, there was uh, Fundamental string, uh, uh, yeah, the number of VPS states, it was known that string theory has this large degeneracy for number of VPS states. And people could do more and more complicated calculations in Salaviyan and Torres. And this problem was mastered essentially. And it involves all kinds of very interesting topics in mathematics like Donaldson Thomas theory, modular forms, single modular forms, mock modular forms. <laughs> Then the third dragon is that Boltzmann actually told you that a degeneracy of a system is the logarithm. Logarithm of the degeneracy equals to the entropy. So how can it be that, how can we com compute the degeneracy? Typically, the counting problems computes just the index. And so index is like the Boltzmann's minus per let's say. Whereas degeneracy is Boltzmann's plus per so in general, the two are equal. And it can actually lead to uh, wrong conclusions if you don't are careful about it in certain context. So you need to have some kind of vanishing theorem to show that the fermions, uh, there are no fermions in the problem. And this we were, this has to, this is another dragon that you have to slay. And uh, we need to understand, and this follows from the index and modularity. Then the path integral is, of course, a, a big beast. I mean, path integral of even a simple perturbative theory like one QED, you cannot do non perturbatively. So, here we are being asked to do a path integral of string here, string fields, exactly. And that just sounds like a crazy thing to try to even do. But what really saves the day is this equivalent localization, which I will describe. But even to implement this localization, it's actually a dragon because the supergravity is a very complicated thing, much much more complicated than quantum field theory. And uh, off-field supergravity is actually what makes it possible because in off-field supergravity, uh, I will come to that in a moment. But another complication of supergravity is that supergravity really has infinite number of uh, uh, terms. It's not a non, it's a non-normalizable theory. So, you know, doing localization in Yangness theory is a very fine problem. You just have a simple action and then you do whatever you want to do, instant terms, course. Here, you have an infinite number of terms. So, even if you succeeded in doing localization, what are you going to do with this? Then we encounter these very subtle number theoretic phases called the Klusterman uh, phases. And they're absolutely crucial for getting integrality. And it looks almost impossible. How can a quantum field theory or supergravity path integral give you this kind of subtle fields? But it turns out that they are related to some ch topological terms and so on. They give you this entire structure in a very beautiful way. Then there is another problem of wall crossing, and this led to this whole development with Don Zagier and some uh, of mock Jacobi forms, which I will not talk about. But that's such a, actually a very interesting and beautiful story, which you need to address if you are going beyond this simple example that I will describe. Um, I think, so can I ask you a question about the, the index that you were mentioning before? So I would have thought in more general cases, not in mind that W was computing the index. Uh, that the gravitational why? path, because of the, the boundary conditions that you're putting in the fermion. So it has the minus one to the F. In the gravitational pattern. Look, we are not putting minus one to the F, right? So I will come to that point. Then there is an R, R symmetry. I will come to that point. Yeah, it's not, I mean, I'm just, there is no minus one to the F, I'm putting a priority. But I thought you could, you could, you can't put the minus one to the F the gravitational pattern. You could, but that's not, what I'm saying is that Boltzmann never told you, right? 
No, 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 but just to simplify, like, you, I mean, you could compute an index, you could type it in an index, and you have it in index. But Patrick's and Morphin and Propy, the Boltzmann, and Boltzmann, no, we deleted Boltzmann. I think it is Boltzmann. Right? I mean, it follows the second law from what I'm saying. Well, you're in an extremal case. No, no, we are in an extremal case. But what I'm saying is that fundamentally, Patrick's and Morphin and Propy is a Boltzmann. And Boltzmann knew nothing about index. That Bozeman only knew about digital systems. Well, but that for me at this stage is an assumption. If you're in a supersymmetric context, uh... even in a supersymmetric context, if I take a generic black hole, uh, entropy should really become equal to the uh, for a big uh, Schwarzschild black hole, right? There is no index. Yeah, but that's not supersymmetric. No, no, but therefore the fundamental notion is degeneracy, not index. In some cases, I think that's part of the challenge, but okay, it's a no. The, what I'm saying is that if I give you a black hole, I tell you that entropy is area upon four, it, it should equal logarithm of the degeneracy, right? Not logarithm of some index. We hope so, but okay. But I, I think in the context of a supersymmetric black hole, I would think that one can define as well gravitationally the index. That's a second level of problem, but what I'm saying is that if, if I Black hole in a, uh, in a uh, let's say, from a near extreme limit. I would expect that the Boltzmann entropy should has tell you something about the degeneracy and not about the index. And it can happen in some cases that the index is zero, but the degeneracy is not. If you're not careful, you can get uh, wrong answers. So I will, it will become clear in a moment, maybe, if I go, go ahead. So you have to sort of slay these dragons. And uh, so the first one is the choice of the ensemble. So uh, that's actually even before we get started. If you're trying to compute quantum corrections to uh, Boltzmann entropy, then uh, the choice of the ensemble matters, whether you're doing grand canonical ensemble or micro canonical ensemble, or, it will give you different answers. So the question is, which ensemble are we choosing? And this is answered by a holography. Basically, the gauge field in two dimensions behave like that. And you can see that the divergent piece, as r goes to infinity, is the boundary term. That is the non-normalizable mode. And the constant piece is the normalizable mode. This is the opposite of what happens in higher dimensions. Where, for example, there, the potential mode follows q upon r, let's say, Coulomb potential. And that's the normalizable mode. And the constant piece is the non-normalizable mode. So, Normally, you hold this fix and let this fluctuate. Whereas in ADS2, you are forced to hold this fix and let this fluctuate, which corresponds to choosing the micro canonical ensemble. So you allow, and that's very important because then you know what ensemble you are choosing. But why do we? Generically, if you calculate, you are doing some Legendre transform. So it agrees only uh, as a, at the saddle point. Right, the state B of N is some data data, no? But it, but it, on the transform of whatever we uh, in, in the thermodynamic limit. In the thermodynamic limit. Right. Yeah. But, but, but we are trying to compute exactly the finite size effects here. Right, because you are considering the black hole to have finite size. Yeah, so the, the point is that if you were only interested in the thermodynamic limit, then that's Bekenstein Hawking entropy. But here we are trying to compute corrections one upon area e to the minus area, uh, it, which is like a foolish thing to try to do, in fact, in a statistical mechanical system. But here we can actually, it's a meaningful question and you can actually calculate it. Now, how do you prove that these are the things in index? And this actually, so I, I agree with you that one can define in the gravitational context, but it has to go through these arguments. So the near horizon of ADS2 has an SU11 symmetry. With four supersymmetries, the closure of algebra requires you to have SU11 slash two supergroup as a symmetry. And therefore, the horizon must also have SU2 symmetry. Okay, this is consistent with the fact that the supersymmetric black holes in four dimensions are spherically symmetric. You do not have supersymmetric black holes in four dimensions which are rotating. So this is consistent with that fact. Now you could have 
from topology horizon. Yeah, that you could have. Uh, uh, yes. But as long as you have uh, the ADS2, yeah, in the, in the external case, it's true that for a generic non external backbone, all kinds of things are possible. But I'm also insisting that it should have an ADS2 throat. No, but ADS2 cross H2. Sorry. No, it's, 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 it's an unengaged. And I want uh, four super solutions. ADS2 cross women's surface. It, yeah, it does not have, uh, that's because you do not have four super symmetry in that case. You just have one super symmetry. I'm demanding that I have four yeah. super symmetry. Yeah, that's four. So that, no. Two Poncari and two. You're demanding this is not really flat. No, first of all, I'm asymptotically flat, but I think for, even for those black holes when you're near horizon, but what is the supergroup in that case? Because uh, what is the action of the C11 on the superfluid, right? This is the only supergroup. Okay, so in certainly for uh, flat space, this is the case. Uh, I, I mean, I know that uh, in ADS5, the black, there are a lot of interesting questions which in ADS5 black holes, which are, or ADS4 black holes, which are, uh, which are worth discussing, but okay, it's not. Now, if you choose my, now, so therefore, the, it has to be spherically symmetric, but spherically symmetric could also mean that the chemical potential is zero and not J is equal to zero. I just argued that we are in the micro concept. So therefore, J is equal to zero. So in fact, you're computing trace minus one to the F is just trace minus one to the J. And therefore, it proves this, that the number, there is the black hole horizon Extremal black hole horizon with so many supersymmetries has to be necessarily bosonic. Wait, why, why is x minus one to the f minus one? If you just look at the action of the the g uh, action, uh, there's a hidden behind your B L H. Sorry, yeah. I I cannot remove that. Somebody else has to remove that. On the screen. Dismiss? No. No. Good <laughs> <laughs> try. Like what happens to young children nowadays? <laughs> <laughs> you have a book, they have time to press. Something. One of us get mouse. Ah, maybe. That's fair. Yeah, good idea. Can you click on start there? No, no. If, it's, I mean, if you just look at the J6 inside this SU2, and it acts on the fermions. So it's just, just the super algebra. So you just the same. Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay, so therefore, it's a what I have convinced you is that it's a well defined problem to try to calculate W and try to calculate D and try to compare the two and com compare an index with a D. The uh, uh, maybe I will talk comment on what your, your question is. It turns out also in the bulk, you can show that the index is equal to D because there is a, uh, you have, because you're integrating with the chemical potential, chemical potential is equal to half is the, uh, and since you're, that's a fluctuating mode as I showed just now. I'm just mostly concerned in more general cases of supersymmetric black holes that for instance, let's say engaged supergravity where you would not have this type of argument as far as symmetry and so. And, but I think in those cases you cannot argue always. Exactly. And sometimes you make mistakes. And so, so that, that's why I think it's uh, it might be more important to directly no, but, compute the index instead of trying to. So actually, uh, for example, Ashok and I and we did that. We call it something like a space time index, and we showed that a lot of confusions in the literature can be resolved if you properly think about. It. So you can look at that paper. This is for the Ashok myself, Sanjeev, and you know, publish. For gauge, not for gauge, but, <laughs> even, but even for non-gauge thing, there are uh, to some leading order there are disagreements. If you are not sure about what you are calculating, if you calculate the index correctly, then it agrees. If you don't do it, then you get mistakes. And the same is true also in and much more complicated in gauge superdivision. But I think it has been studied a bit by some people. Okay, now I'm going to consider like the sort of the harmonic oscillator. So there has been a lot of very beautiful work and Suresh is not here, but yeah. uh, with single modular forms and so on, the counting problem is itself very interesting and challenging. And that has been mastered in many non-trivial cases. But the simplest is 
uh, a dion in a type 2 on T6 with uh, four charges, uh, electric and magnetic, and the duality invariant is Q squared P square minus Q dot P square. So there are 28 electric charges, 28 magnetic charges, uh, you know, is equal to eight super which in four dimensions. And the, it does not depend on these 56 charges, but it depends only on this one combination, which is a big simplification. And the partition function is given by this. It's basically some D1, D5 system, which has four fermions and four bosons. So you can more or less recognize four bosons and four fermions. And this is a problem you can just put on the computer and calculate this Fourier coefficient. This is that happens to be a Jacobi form and so on. And the degeneracy is related to these Fourier coefficients. So that problem is solved. DQP, you have solved. What does Y count? Y counts basically is the chemical potential for the uh, spin. It's not really the spin, it's actually Q dot P in this case. So there is a chemical potential corresponding to Q dot P. That contributes to the angular uh, There is some, uh, it doesn't continue, no, sir. We are talking about four dimensional black holes, so there is no angular moment. But it can have Q dot P. It turns out that if you lift it to uh, five dimensions using this 4D, 5D lift by putting it at the center of the top, unit, then it actually becomes angular momentum. So it is angular momentum, but you know, slightly. So now, can we prove W of delta is equal to D of delta? Now, Wait just a second. I missed my one of. I think I might have changed the order of. Yeah. Okay. It's fine. Now, how can you directly land on an integer if you're doing the path integral? So, path integral will give you a complex number. It looks almost impossible that you land on an integer. What makes it possible is that you can use that integer. This is an analytic number theory. You can express using hardy ramanujan Rademacher expansion by this very beautiful formula. It's a very convergent, exactly convergent and exact formula, rapidly convergent and exact formula. That, that integer, so this could be eight, for example, or eight is one of the <laughs> coefficients, by the way, is equal to this, uh, some Bessel function. Sorry, this should be a pi over C square root of delta and this Lustomann phases, which are rather complicated phases. So D of delta has this very beautiful ex expression, which looks more analytic because this is, uh, this is a Bessel function. You know, I can sort of recognize the Bessel function. And maybe that's a good way to, and, and in fact, if you look at the expansion of this Bessel function, it goes as exponential of Z. So that's your basically exponential of the area upon four, as you will recognize, because Z is basically, this is basically area. So it's area upon four is the leading, uh, Answer. So the question is, can we repackage, the, can we do the path integral such that instead of just getting exponential of z, we get the Bessel function? And can we get all these factors and instruments? And the answer quite remarkable is yes. So the structure of the microscopic answer suggests that W of delta should have this structure. And higher Cs are exponentially subleading. Okay, and what we will find is that those exponentially subleading terms come from some subleading saddle points or default saddle points of, on the ADS2 path. So this structure suggested by hardy ramanujan formula is actually very nicely replicated, uh, can be replicated in the path integral. But to do the path integral to get the Bessel function looks almost impossible. So we have to sum over, integrate over all the three fields, how are you going to proceed? But now equivariant localization and supergravity will allow you to do this. How is the integers out of that? Yes. Is there anywhere? No, not that I know. No, no. I'm sure there are the simple statics system, probably. If you could really, I mean, if you could evaluate the combinator equally. Yeah, from a field theory, it looks almost impossible. That's and that's possible here because, as I will say, string theory is not just uh, UV complete, but it's really UV rigid. And it gives you all the other higher order terms with very precise coefficients. It's not like QCD. 
See, QCD, you can add any higher derivative term with arbitrary coefficient. In string theory, you cannot do that. The higher the coefficient, if it is the higher derivative coefficient, which you think is unimportant, the flow energies is super important for getting this algorithm. So it's you're really accessing uh, way beyond what effective field theory is giving. No, it's absolutely correct. I'm, to, to my mind, it's actually astonishing that you're able to do this. And what makes it possible is modular symmetry. The Hardy Ramanujan formula basically uses the modular symmetry. So it's a very symmetric function. The object that we, the partition function that we took for computing, it's actually a Jacobi form. So it also has shift symmetry under this variable z. So e to the 2 pi z is y, and e to the 2 pi i tau is q. So it's basically, it has a big symmetry. It's a very symmetric function. And using that symmetry, you are able to get the Hardy Ramanujan. So this uh, elliptic properties, basically the modular properties, sorry, elliptic properties are basically the shift symmetries and modular properties uh, imply this formula. And similar things are known also for dynamic states in n equal to four and other. So, I mean, I think there is a whole beautiful story in uh, less supersymmetry, which I'm not going to go to. I'm just going to focus on this particular example, just to be concrete. Now, this is really a big dragon. The generalized Klusterman sun that appears in this formula is this really god awful collection of phases. Very and these Klusterman suns are quite important, have some deep number theory behind it. And these appear in the highly subleading, exponentially subleading corrections to the Wittgenstein Hawking metric. But you could normally ignore it in the normal physics context. But since we are ambitious and we want to actually get an integer, it really matters whether you're getting eight or you're getting 7.9995, right? And you will not get exactly eight if you don't get this phase, right? So string theory somehow has to know how to reproduce this phase. So here is where the power of quantum holography. And this is also a test of quantum holography because all the Beautiful work that has been done on holography for the last 30 years. Almost 99% of it is really using gravity, classical gravity, to learn about strongly reproduced theories. But one of my, when I signed on to state theory, it was to do quantum theory of gravity. And what has holography taught us about gravity? You really have to go beyond finite entities. And this is exactly what we are computing. We are trying to compute finite area, it's finite side effect. So quantum holography in this case implies that W of delta is equal to D of delta, which again has a, they said in it's, it's this prediction that a path integral should be an integer. Second prediction is that the index must be positive because you're computing D of delta is equal to W of delta. Uh, and I, all the arguments that I gave is supposed on it. This also actually, it's a prediction for the modular forms. But the generically, if I give you a modular form, uh, is Fourier coefficients don't have to be positive, necessarily. But it shows that the modular forms which will appear in the black hole complex must be such that their Fourier coefficients are positive. And in fact, this, this prediction is also borne out in many other non trivial examples, and in particular in this example. So now let me just very quickly remind you the idea of localization. The idea of localization is that if you're doing some com complicated path integral over fields, it, it basically follows from the fact that the Grassmann integral is zero. If you, if you have Grassmann variable theta, then the integral is zero. So if your path integral doesn't depend on some Fermionic degree of freedom, then you are reduced your path integral will have a factor which goes as d theta is equal to zero. So therefore, you'll get zero everywhere, except probably at some critical points. And therefore, your path integral collapses to the critical points where uh, critical points of this Grassmann uh, symmetry. We think of del by del theta as the vector. And this has been used by Dustermart, Heckman, Witten, Nekrasso, Peston. We want to now apply this to super string theory. Now, of course, in string theory, string field theory, despite heroic efforts, I don't think string field theory is at the point. Everyone can 
can set the calculation. But you can do this in string supergravity. And the idea being, you integrate out all the massive, massive modes, and you get a supergravity Lagrangian with infinite number of terms. And I, I'm happy to live with that. And then I just try to do the path integral of supergravity using standard methods. And localization basically requires you to identify some uh, bosonic symmetry Q, which this is the equivalent localization is called because Q squared is equal to H for some compact bosonic field. So it can, it can be some field like that. And then the fixed points of that compact bosonic field is where the things will localize. So Q is nil potent on H invariant configurations. And there are some standard arguments that you give. So you basically, the way you actually implement it in real life is that you, suppose you want to introduce a path, evaluate a path integral Z of Z, which is d mu e to the, some action. Then you deform it by some lambda by adding to it a term, which is Q of Q of V, where V is a H invariant fermionic function. And since H of V is equal to Q square of V is equal to zero, you can prove very easily that Z of lambda is independent of lambda. So then you can use lambda as one upon H bar and do it in the, you can, put, if you put lambda equal to zero, you recover your original partition function. But you can take lambda to be infinity. In that case, lambda can be one upon H bar. And then you can ignore this action essentially. And you can do uh, a perturbative expansion, semi-classical expansion. And the semi-classical expansion will be exact. So that's the idea of localization. So the idea is that we want to add some term like that Q of V to our, but before we set it up, let me tell you about, let me sing to you the, what is the word? I don't know, to the beauty of uh, uh, offshore supergravity. I mean, it's a, offshore supergravity, of course, you have to look at her in a certain way to find the beauty. <laughs> but the main point why the offshore supergravity is beautiful is the following. Is that... Uh, if you do not have options, then the... Okay, for example, let's look at uh, diffeomorphism. So that in diffeomorphism, we write down the variation of the fields fundamentally once and for all. And then you just have to figure out what are invariant under this. So you can take R, R square, and so on. And then you can add them. If you had to change your variation, depending on the equations of motion, then you won't be able to do this. See? So that's the problem with unshield supergravity. And unshield supergravity, the supersymmetric transformation close only after using equations of motion. So you have to keep on, if you want to add another term like higher derivative term, you have to keep on modifying. So the beauty is that if you put all the offset fields and find some analog of this, which really doesn't depend on equations of motion, then it just becomes a problem of finding the invariance of that field. And you just add, you can just consider the invariance and add them to your action. And you don't have to keep on modifying the equations of motion. That's the main advantage of options of the value. It's just like global. Exactly. You need to add, uh, yeah, in global supersymmetry, the simplest example is that the F, so it, for example, you know, you get F is equal to del V by del phi mm -hmm. after solving the equation of motion. If you don't have F in the game, then your supersymmetry transformation depends on V or your superpotential, sorry. And you have to keep, if you're modifying your superpotential, you have to modify the, and that complicates the whole thing. So, so the and so it nicely separates this very difficult problem into two parts. You first find optional localizing solutions once and for all. They don't depend on the physical action. So, and John and uh, uh, Samir solved this problem, you know, 10 years ago for n equal to two supergravity. Then you can give me any action that you want and I can evaluate that action on those solutions. So you completely, and those are quite universal. And then you have to evaluate the normal action on those solutions. So these are the two main advantages, but there are challenges. 
first challenge is the Euclidean gravity as a conformal factor, which is the wrong sign. So how do you make sense of the path in theory? But of course, this we have encountered also, for example, in string, string theory, in world sheet string theory. You have this x naught, the time variable. And for all that you have to do is you have to choose the proper contour of integration to give meaning to the Gaussian integral. For example, you know very well. This is equal to square root of five. This is defined in some proper analytic continuation. When a is positive, this is not really fine. What you do is you change the contour slowly, appropriately, and you can recover this one. But more important problem is that the normally to apply localization, the metric is fixed, and then you apply localization. But here, metric is one of the random fields. So how can you even get started? You know? And this actually requires some quite subtle thing. We did it heuristically. And then later on, this was understood better by Samir and Dewitt and Please. Uh, and at a more fundamental level, everything is a gate symmetry. So how do you even use, this is a gate symmetry. It's not a global symmetry. But of course, some of the part of the gate symmetry is a global symmetry because it's a symmetry of the asymptotic boundary. So you have to make that separation. So these are all these technical problems. And finally, unlike in quantum field theory, we have infinite number of higher derivative terms. So how are you, even if you suppose to found the localizing manifold, how can you actually do anything? So the strategy is to use background field BRST quantization, which I won't go into. These parameters that don't vanish at infinity generate killing symmetries. And these are the symmetries that we use to localize. Use offshore super conformal super gravity. And we will use non renormalization theorems in an important way. And it turns out that in this particular simple problem, uh, all the higher derivative terms are D type terms and they evaluate to zero on the black hole horizon. And there is a only F time plus contribute, which in the N equal to 8 case are summarized by a single prepotential. And if you know the prepotential, you are done. To the choice of Q and V, there is a basically you have to choose a particular specific killing spinner of the ADS2 cross S2, which I will not go into. And you, you calculate Q of epsilon psi i. This is your action. This is your localizing action. And what it is going to give you is that it's going to localize your path integral to the solutions of this equation. Q epsilon of psi i. Psi i are all the fields. So you take all the fields of supergravity, solve Q epsilon of psi equal to zero. And this we did, and the answers are surprisingly simple. We found the localizing manifold, and the localizing manifold is given by so many real numbers. So if you have NV vector multiplets, the localizing manifold, so this infinite dimensional path integral over supergravity collapses to a finite dimensional ordinary integral over NV plus one uh, real numbers. So it's an NV plus one dimensional ordinary integral. So the path integral collapses to this ordinary integral. And these are basically the scalar fields in each vector multiplet. And these are the auxiliary fields. And this is what I want to point out. I mean, you ask this, uh, the auxiliary fields play a very important role here. So why why are, are the analogs of the X field in the chiral superfield? And what is happening here is that they are getting an expectation value in this localizing. They have a non-zero expectation value. So you are not finding the minima of some physical action. Your fields are somewhere high up, somewhere in some random place in the field space. So your uh, physical uh, equations of motion may be this manifold, but the localizing manifold is somewhere else. And the reason those equations are satisfied is because the auxiliary fields also get expectation values, and they are sort of holding this ball up, you know, it's not getting it fall down. So it's very important that the auxiliary fields are present, and they actually play a very mounting role. So it's not only for simplicity, but actually in real working works out like that. But then you have to evaluate the supergravity action. Now, even if you restrict yourself to this chiral supergravity action uh, uh, specified by this one single uh, prepotential. So if i, g are some derivatives and so on, 
It again looks really god awful. It really looks impossible that we can write it in some simple form. But yeah, I will just write this. In the end, the whole answer collapses to this. And it is given entirely in terms of the prepotential. A very simple answer in terms of the prepotential. Okay. I thought the, the point of this of this localization procedure was that we add this extra term, right? And then when you in the limit lambda goes to infinity, only that extra term survives. Yeah. And it doesn't even matter what the anomalous yeah, action is. Yeah, yeah. So why was it important uh, that uh, you know the d term vanishes because you're not, no, no, it's not you're not evaluating? No, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, it's a very good question, and I was uh, mixing the two things. So what I'm saying is that as far as finding the localizing solution, it doesn't matter. What details you have, what higher derivative you have. But when I want to evaluate this action, I have to now evaluate, substitute that localizing solution into my action. So what I'm saying is that it's true that your real path in the is something like this. It's true that this term will dominate, but this term is not zero. You have to evaluate it. That, that's, I mean, it will give you an order h bar correction and order one upon lambda correction. That you have to give. So the, the saddle point is coming from saddle the point is coming from here, here, and then you have to evaluate it on this. So what happens is that this is reducing basically to the integral over DCI, a finite dimensional integral. So times e to the minus s of this saddle, which depends on ci, times some determinants, which also depend on ci. Now, of course, even a finite dimensional integral, quite often you cannot do. In this particular problem, the happy fact is that you can actually do everything in the end. See? Just like, why are you looking at offshore? Our conformal supergravity simplifies the calculation because, yeah, in principle, you could just do supergravity, but conformal supergravity simplifies the calculation by basically allows it to somehow the only the conformal factor of the metric you can separate in a nice way. Yeah, it's for calculation. Mm -hmm. You could have done, and I think that's the formalism that is best developed for any by any written conformal. So, you know, the final answer looks something like that, okay? I don't want to... Now, uh, if you look at the n equal to 8 supergravity, the prepotential has some very specific form. And if you put it all together, you get exactly the... Some of the integrals are just Gaussians, which you can do. Some of the finite dimensional integrals that are left to be done. And in the end, you're left with, with a single integral. And which you recognize as the integral representation of the Bessel function, the famous Bessel function that we encounter. So after all this dust settles, you land precisely on the Bessel function. And in fact, you have to do an analytic continuation of this contour. And this S is actually the conformal factor of the metric. It's related to the conformal factor, which, which has a wrong sign kinetic term, as we know. So you have to choose a proper contour to give meaning to this to get the Bessel function. Otherwise, so, we would have done huh? minus seven. No, no, the, otherwise I think it's not defined. No, there's a way, there's a different choice of contour, but it gives you a vessel function with the, the I'm sure, yeah, yeah you can yeah, get so that. So it's kind of like, uh, so in some sense, there was more than one contour that you can pick, but you know that given the passing Yeah, one. I think probably you can fix which one by matching yeah. onto semi classical or something. No, 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 both of them have the same exponential behavior. I see. It's a subleading, uh, they, they defer by exponentially suppressed. Because the difference between two vessel functions is like some syllogy. Okay, so what about now? So we want to get ambitious and we want to, this is just the first term, but you remember you had infinite number of terms where this was replaced by one day, this divided by C. And if you recall, we are doing the path integral over this. And there is actually a time, there is another circle inside. So in fact, you're doing some kind of a path integral on ADS2, ADS. You can actually think of it as an ADS3, a solid cylinder path integral. Okay. 
Now it is well known that the boundary of the solid cylinder is T2, and it has you can make SL to Z transformations. It's a conformal P2 because you're in AS3. And you can make SL to Z transformation, and this is related to Del twists. In, uh, uh, but basically, you can take the boundary and do an SL to Z transformation and glue it back. And so you get different geometries whose boundaries are related to each other by SL to Z transformations. And you can actually write down explicit metric solutions, and they look like this. So they depend only on uh, the, uh, if you have SL to Z, it actually depend on A and C. Somehow A, A appears somewhere. It's not. It, it appears in the gauge field. So basically, it specified they have bound. Uh, uh, sorry, C and D. They are labeled by two integers. So basically, you have boundaries specified by two integers, and you have to sum over all of them. And in fact, uh, the calculation, as far as the local calculation is concerned, this is just some topological twist, which is just changing some topological uh, properties. Locally, you're still solving the same supergravity equations. But what happens is that you reduce the volume by a factor of C, and as a result, the action gets reduced by a factor of C. So that explains that you basically end up getting uh, the same Bessel function as you got, well, the only difference is that the action gets reduced by a factor of C. And these are some subleading uh, obvious fold side points. So let me recap. Point is that if you just do the path integral, you get this basic function. But you realize that there are subleading saddle points where the boundary is an SL to Z transform of the original boundary that you started with. And it corresponds to some metric inside, which has the same asymptotic boundary condition. But it has a different behavior. You can see that this, when r goes to infinity, this term is unimportant. So asymptotically, they all look the same. So you should integrate over all of them. You should sum over all of them. And they have basically, it's like a, a Z -A -Z -C, uh, rotation of this disk. The orbifold is basically like a ZC rotation of the disk, which reduces the size of the disk by a factor of C. And therefore, the action reduces by a factor of C. And so you end up getting the Bessel function structure completely correctly. What about this Klusterman sum? It turns out that even though the localization doesn't depend on the topology, there are John Simon's terms present in your action, which do care about the topology. And there is a whole story which I'm not going to tell you uh, in detail. It goes back to the work of Witten and uh, uh, basically computing John Simon's invariance on length spaces and subjury and so on. And there is a whole story that is explained in my paper with uh, John Gomes and Murthy and non-perturbative corrections too. And you have various gauge fields in the game. You have some U1 field, SU2 field, SU2 R. These are the R symmetries. And they reproduce exactly all these beautiful non-trivial uh, phases in the Klusterman sum from the Chern Simons action. So basically, doing the Chern Simons, there is a Chern Simons terms in the bulk action to the supergravity, and you just calculate, treat them uh, for this particular topology. And since they are only topological, they don't interfere with your localization story, but they do contribute to the phases in the non way. Uh, so, oh, okay. oh. well, I, I, I'll just try and understand when you invoke gap theory in to, to get these extra contributions. So you, you're just looking at the offshore supergravity in four dimensions. But then you suddenly invoke in theory to say that you should take these something inside. So, so, so uh, did I let me just think whether that was necessary to have in theory or uh, well uh, maybe it's related to also what I was going to ask from a four-dimensional point of view, you're adding singular configurations. Locally they respect your supersymmetric conditions, but they only make sense as like smooth contributions if you go one dimension higher. Yes, yes. And then from a five dimensional perspective, they look smooth and then that's what Yeah, so basically if you just want to be in the ADS2, you are computing a ZC orbifold, which has a fixed point here. But then you are, there is an internal circle and you carry out a shift along the circle. So the net action is uh, I think you can describe that shift as some, uh, there is a gauge field 
I think there might be a four-dimensional description uh, to describe it as a uh, some kind of yeah, yeah, some some action on the charge charge fields. Yeah. But you need to keep track of that. And it's easiest to think in a higher dimensional. And, and the but, I but with that uh, because in, in general the integrality of C, I thought. Oh no, no, sorry. Okay. And the lens space you mentioned, yeah. I mean, you didn't want to talk about it, but the not where, where is the lens space? Yeah, is uh, it a no, no, so basically, uh, what is the lens space? I forgot now, it is this myself. So basically, you have this, uh, it's when you do surgery, right? You suppose you have some knot, you remove a cylinder around it. But does the orbital act on the S2? Yeah, it's a more basic question. We're, we're just the lens space itself. Forget the knots. What was it? It was the two sphere plus the M theory circle? Yeah. yeah. Basically, okay, think yeah. of ADS3, right? Think of ADS3. So ADS3 is a solid cylinder. So exactly. So ADS3 is a solid cylinder. And you are doing some depth in your, you can. Identify this with that, or you can do some identify after some twists. And that's what is going to so be. So the overflow was acting both in the S2 and the ADS2. Uh, S1 and ADS. No, 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 not S2. The S1. Not S1. 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 No, not S2. Not S2. Ah, okay. So where, where is the three sphere? Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, okay. Sorry, maybe if. if, if. No, I mean, basically, uh, it, it's a some uh, subsidiary problem, but we are looking at ADS2 plus S1, which you can think of as related to ADS3. And the ADS3 is a hyperbolic space whose boundary. So if you uh, if you do surgery, if you remove a knot from an S3, then you get a hyperbolic space. So it's, that, it's, it's through that connection, it's not related to the S2. So the overflow doesn't act on this too at all? No. No? no. Okay. Okay. So remarkably, this is our pot of gold. I mean, we have slayed a lot of dragons. And the uh, pot of gold is that W of delta is an integer. And the path integral, which is a complex analytic continuous object, gives an integer, which is a number theoretic discrete object. And this is really gives an IR window into a UV because this is really goes well beyond uh, effective field theory because you really needed to know very precise higher derivative term in string theory. Otherwise, you will not get this action. It counts with precision non perturbative states whose masses are much higher than the string scale because you are computing deep range states which are integrated out. So, we could actually turn it around. I mean, for example, in n equal to six models, the counting problem is not known. But you could, in principle, do the super gravity. I mean, super gravity could predict number theoretic objects. I think this is a really very interesting connection that there is really number theory on the black hole horizon. There is some discrete structure to the black hole horizon. Can you ask a question here? Coming back to, to, to something you said earlier, you said that, that um, in order to deal with this uh, n equals to a theory, that it's enough to uh, just be times seven vector multiples in n equals to two. So nine. that's actually not correct. Uh, and I will come to that in a moment. So if you want to take a one line slogan, and I thank Igor Plevana for the slogan from this talk, if you don't remember everything, you can say it's really that to show that Cardi goes to Hardy. <laughs> because the classical Bekenstein Hopping entropy is given by the Cardi formula, just the leading answer. The exact quantum entropy is given by the Hardy Raman. <laughs> And Hadi Rama, but it doesn't line with <laughs> So Hardy goes to Hardy, and then you can say Rama. <laughs> I think it's quite remarkable and it's highly non trivial that all quantum corrections are computable in string theory and combine into a specific integral. So if somebody in new quantum gravity tells you that, okay, we can also do the area, I think string theory really has some very deep structure. Which one should not uh, uh, we get kind of inert to it, but I think it's really highly not trivial that string theory is able to do this. And we basically followed our nose and did the calculation, and you get the answer. 
So there were some hidden dragons as well. Sorry, the, the, the N equals six you mentioned. What, what, didn't you just use N equals two? No, no, no. The, the counting problem in N equal to eight theory gave you this particular. The counting problem in N equal to four gives you some Siegel modular form. The counting problem for N equal to six has not been solved. So I'm saying that uh, I'm talking about the calculation of this D of QP. The D of QP problem has not been done for uh, n equal to six. So if somebody can do the W of QP following these methods, then you can actually predict what is the QP. Do you have problems with the action knowing what the- No, no, I think because you require some D brains, so you want the rotation of compute, compute W, do you know? I don't know. I don't know. I haven't attempted it, but I think in principle it is doable. Because for the N equal eight case, it was T that, yeah. that you knew what the big potential But was. I expect that the big potential for this might be known. And it most likely doesn't receive a lot of corrections. I think there must be some finite already in N equal to four also. There is only one spectrum beyond the class. The F term has a, only one term in addition to the class. So I'm sure that n equal to six is also a rule. I missed this question, but was when did we put it in region to make in your gravitation? Not in the gravitation. No, no. I did put it in the, the number of vector multiplets. All this, this seven by two depends on how many vector multiplets. Is it equal to n equal to four? Then uh, it's different. different. Yeah. You get a different. But uh, be, be your be your procedure would still work. The yeah, procedure would work. You put your on the yeah, yeah, yeah. And you would you get, get some answer. I, yeah, you would get different answers. And then the F, the pre potential will change, the number of vector multiplets will change. So the localizing solutions will not change. But a lot of the other structure will change, and therefore the action will change, the integration will change, and the answer will change. But yeah. they didn't work out? Uh, uh, to, uh, to a point, and you cannot do it it's so completely because you have to recover a single model of farming that you cannot do. But, and there are wall crossing phenomena. So there's a whole story there. But uh, to, uh, next to subdating order, people have calculated. And it is a we, You also needed the fact that all the non renormalizable terms were like exact terms. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that also happens. In so that I think is believed to happen also in equal to four and in equal to six, most likely. So I think it's n equal to six is in a doable regime. regime. I'm not easy, but doable regime. So there are some hidden dragons, and in view of the time, maybe I should. But there were all kinds of very subtle points about uh, how do we even use localization? Did we do the truncation of n equal to eight to equal to two? Is that justified? Do we come? And there is a whole nice story that I just want to very quickly. And this is the, mostly the work of Samir and his collaborators, David Murthy, Reyes, John and Murthy. They showed how to do localization in supergravity because, as I said. There are all kinds of problems because uh, uh, super, su supersymmetry algebra closes only up to gauge something. So q square is not very equal to h, but plus a gauge to h. So you have to add to it the BRST charge. But the problem in supergravity is even worse that the structure constants are actually field dependent. It's what is called the soft algebra. And uh, and these people really, it's a uh, it's a very nice paper, and they basically have solved this problem. Then uh, you cannot, there is no optional formulation of n equal to eight algebra with finite number of auxiliary fields. But that's why we had used n equal to two truncation when we did this calculation. But then it is not satisfactory for computing the determinants. And we were, there were some factors that we were not getting right. And we basically fudged that, those factors in front of, I mean, we were getting the vessel functions right, but the index of the vessel function would be seven by two or nine by two, and we were not sure. And there is some coefficient in front, like C, which could was not right. And it turns out that it's not just a minor problem, and it had to be done correctly. And that was done by Reyes and Murthy, and Ilesio, Murthy, and Turiachi. Nice, nice papers, where they what they did was that they realized only two supersymmetries, but on the entire set of n equal to h supermultiplets, and that's sufficient to run the machine of localization. The treatment of zero modes, there are actually infinity of, we, we computed some determinants, but there are actually infinite number of zero modes having to do with the fact that ADS2 boundary is a circle, but it could actually wiggle around like that. It's a bit like the uh, brown Hano SL2 story in ADS3. This is, of course, basically deep S1. 
but mod uh, is a super, uh, symmetry which is generated by L0, L1, and L1. This, it's that's the group that you have to, uh, and this is exactly determined by uh, by the uh, what is that we call the Schwarzschild theory. So the zero modes is precisely given by the Schwarzschild action, and the integral over zero modes will give you some additional factor. There are zero modes, so the rest of the thing doesn't depend on it, but it can give you some volume factor, which depends volume of zero modes, which will depend on the charges of the black hole and some temperature, if you just go slightly up temperature. And this is exactly the problem that has come up in SYK theory. And the physics of near extremal, I mean, one way, the, the way I like to think of SYK model is that, which was done by Moitra, Saki, and Trivedi, that the physics of the near extremal black hole, so we are now going off extremality, put on some temperature, and you have some chemical potential. But if you tune the chemical potential and temperature in such a way, then it is fully captured by these zero modes, the physics of the zero modes. And that is basically described by the Schwarzschild action. And that's exactly what you get as the low energy limit of SYK model. So the SYK model is basically capturing just the physics of these models. And you can calculate the integral over the, those zero modes, the path integral sort of over this group. And this has been done. And the volume, it's actually easy to see there are three bosonic zero modes. That's why you get this three over two. It's like a, this is some ultra locality argument. So the, this specific temperature dependence t to the power of three by two was what was very interesting for SYK. And that's what they found. That's what you get. But this tells you that now, if you go to extremality, take t equal to zero, the whole thing that I've told you doesn't make sense. I will get zero. My answer would have been just zero. But fortunately, in supersymmetry situation, there are three fermionic zero modes, and they precisely cancel this factor and they get a nice answer. So this actually, uh, a nice paper by Elezio, Murti, and Turiachi explained how in the non-supersymmetric case, you get uh, SYK kind of behavior, p to the power three half. Whereas in the supersymmetric case, there is no temperature dependence. Okay. So that concludes my, uh, I have a whole uh, half of the talk to give in 15 minutes. <laughs> but uh, what should I do? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, no, so I can skip. Okay, let me make this philosophical comment. So is quantum gravity dual or emergent? So it is quantum gravity, one point of view which I subscribe to is that it is quantum gravity is exactly dual to CA. In much the same way that heterotic string is exactly dual to type one string. Okay. It's a duality. In one, one may be simpler than the other in one corner. And M theory has its own rules of computation with some as yet unknown non perturbative formulation. And ADS safety is just a special corner of this duality. Other point of view, which is more popular, I mean, this is a, the old school, I would say. The new school point of view is that ADS quantum gravity is emerging from CFT. So you just write down any dirty CFT and that's quantum gravity. I really find this quite unreasonable because quantum gravity is supposed to be hard. And how did it happen? So condensed matter physics can solve it. But the thing is that as, as we can see clearly from the SYK model, you can capture some of the very interesting physics going away from extremality in the infrared limit, but it's it's not. Uh, uh, it's, I don't think it is true that it gives you the UV completion. Yeah. yeah. So our, I think our computations argue in favor of one. I mean, I, I'm not uh, fanatic about this point of view. This is philosophical point. <laughs> Maybe it's true that the second point of view is correct, but all integers, but the reason I believe that the first point of view is correct is that in this case, ADS 2 CFT1, any integer, I mean, by the argument that any CFT defines quantum gravity, I would say that any integer defines ADS2, which is clearly not true. I think you have a very sparse set of integers uh, which come in the black hole counting, which, which seem to be the rest of the ADS2. It's not like every integer you can associate with it. CFT1 in this case is just trivial. Finite dimensional Hilbert space of dimension equal to D. 
So we cannot associate with every finite dimension of the inverse space and the EDS. I don't think that is true. You think it's true? I don't know. <laughs> it could be true, but I find it hard to believe. <laughs> No, I mean, in the calculations that we have been able to do, that these are some very special instances. So the the yes. No, I mean, in order for this duality to hold, in order to say that this is a description of the uh, quantum gravity in ADS2, at least there is no evidence to believe that it is true for every day. It may be true, but there is no, at the moment, the once the cases that we have come across, are very specific integers having to do with black hole vision. Do you mean that the large radius too? So the point is that no, with this calculation in the end, D of delta could really be 500 as well, one of the four year But you have the capacity of taking delta very large. Yeah, I have the capacity of taking delta very large. But in that second kind of alternative theory, I mean, idea, you, you want to. No, it's certainly true that at large, this I don't doubt that uh, in large delta uh, there is a, uh, but it, it's like in duality that in some regime, one description may be simpler. <laughs> okay, anyway, this is a philosophical point, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. If I can, or am I done? I'm done, actually. You, you... Yeah, apparently it's not, yeah. So you because I have been able to calculate uh, assuming, okay, modulo, I mean, you can take it some moderate size so that you're not worried about. No, I'm going to go. So you can go down, okay, going down maybe, but suppose you take something finite, which is of the order of 10 to the power 5. No, no, but then you still will not get the right answer, exact integer, unless you do this whole path integral correctly. I mean, I'm not saying 10 to the 5. I really mean 1, 3, 4, 9, 7, let's say. Well, your, your okay. question is roughly, let's say from the point of view of modular forms, if I hand you a modular form, we'll have a Rademacher expansion. You're basically saying when the Rademacher expansion has a path integral yeah, equivalent, then that's ADS. Yeah, so we, yeah exactly right. I mean, it indicates that only in a few cases, yeah, it's not, there is no evidence at the moment. Okay. So that in case then we can ask the, the question which modular forms can I recast the Rademacher expansion as a path integral yeah. computation? Exactly. Where it was an integral over some. I mean, this is the analog of saying that some very special, I mean, this has also been. People are studying this. Not every conformal free theory has the features to have an ADS dual, right? You need to have a mass gap of certain kind. Right, right, right. All these features have to be there, right? Otherwise, you cannot say, I mean, this is too simplistic to say that, okay, every conformal free theory is ADS. Right? This is not how it is, seems to be working. So, and I think uh, this is an extreme, uh, perhaps very simplified, but extreme example. No, but it's something that in principle one could, if you phrase it in you could, this yeah. way, you could. You could ask, ask yeah. the math question yeah, like, you ask. when it's possible to write down this discrete sum in terms of an integral. Uh, over, yeah, for an integral over some contours, like so over your S variables or quantum thing. Like, I think when it's coming from modular forms, you do have parameter experience. So it's fine. But I think not every integer comes from the Fourier function. So. Okay, I think, okay, let's not get into philosophy. Uh, let me very quickly go to my second part, second talk. <laughs> uh, this is quantum entanglement in string theory. And I think maybe I can just motivate why this problem is interesting. And I'll just tell you about the, since I'm coming back here in November, that's where the workshop is on. I can give my technical talk at that time. Uh, but let me say, since this is the topic of this thing, so entanglement entropy is of fundamental importance in quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, but I think even more so in quantum gravity. But it's not possible at the moment to define a notion of entropy directly. Because finiteness of, but I just want to tell you that finiteness of entanglement entropy is really at the heart of the information paradox problem in uh, black hole physics. Because if you could trace over the internal degrees of freedom of a black hole, then you'll get some density matrix for the outside. But we know very well that that has a famous area divergence. And uh, in quantum field theory, 
Entanglement entropy basically, if you trace over the left of the room, it diverges. And there is some quite detailed understanding of this fact, you know, in terms of the fond algebra and so on. But uh, so, in fact, the fond entropy, strictly speaking, is not even defined. And if it diverges, it means that the number of qubits in this system is infinite. That's what is indicating. But that can possibly, if that is the case, then information can get lost because it will just uh, it will become like a remnant or something like that. And therefore, if you can show finiteness, and secondly, this divergence is an ultraviolet divergence. So since string theory is a UV complete theory and UV finite theory, you might hope that if you can formulate some notion of entanglement entropy in string theory, it will turn out to be finite. And that's the problem that Upamanyu and I addressed uh, in some of the recent papers. And going back to some of the earlier work that I had done on our defaults, but we have some progress to report where we can actually argue that you can calculate finite entanglement entropy in string theory using this on the full check. So uh, since it's a review talk, maybe I should review the importance of entanglement entropy in this problem and then not report on the results that I got. Any other way around? Huh? <laughs> other, whichever way you want. I'm happy to do both. Okay, I can give the, the my introductory, but if I jump to this, it may, it may be without context. I think, okay, let me just see. It's a lot to cover. <laughs> okay, let me just stop at some specific, uh, some reasonable point. If I can go 10 minutes over. Yeah. So the classic example of entanglement is a, a bell pair. This is the spooky EPR correlation. So you know, one you can divide it into left and right, this room, and one photon is on the left of the room, and one is in the Andromeda galaxy, and the one is here. And the state is entangled. It's a maximally entangled pure state in a bipartite Hilbert space. And this is very different from an entang unentangled pure state, like up, both up and both. Or just up and down. And the way to characterize this entanglement is the density matrix. So you just do a partial trace over the left Hilbert space, left of the room, and then you get a, a reduced density matrix for the right part of the room, right side of the room. And uh, that's the fine grain microscopic Feynman entropy of this is the entanglement entropy. And you can see in this particular case, it just gives a log two, which tells you that there are two degrees of freedom. So that's the number of qubits that the other system has. They are able to learn. And that's why I was saying that for the. Now, this is actually one of the calculations which you can do in quantum field theory exactly. And uh, it turns out to be UV divergent. But even then, it's quite interesting. So you have a, suppose you have a d dimensional uh, uh, quantum gravity. Then you divide it, y is the some kind of a transverse coordinate. So you have x and t, and you divide it into left and right. And uh, it turns out that you might be tempted to regard the left Hilbert space and the right Hilbert space as being exactly factorized. But that doesn't turn out to be the case. And that's actually the reason for this ultraviolet divergence. And if you just naively do the calculation, you find that the entropy goes as area of the transverse directions divided by some ultraviolet cutoff. So this was actually a very nice observation by several people in the past. I think it goes back to Bombay, Lee, Kaul, and I forget various people um, will check and uh, who, uh, so, uh, so, okay. Sorkin, Sorkin, Sorkin. Sorkin was the first one actually. And uh, then Uglam and Saskin and so on. So, uh, how can you do it as a, okay, so you can actually do it using a replica trick. I don't want to now maybe explain the method, how you do it. But the replica trick is basically, instead of computing trace rho log rho, which is quite complicated to calculate, you compute trace rho to the power n. And trace rho to the power n by some arguments is given by 
considering n copies of the plane cut so you are basically integrating over the left of the and you are want to keep the right right side so you put the cut on the right side and you take a n sheeted n covered whatever it's called n sheeted n sheeted n fold cover of the okay uh, connected at this branch point and then you can calculate that quantity more easily because it's some trace row to the power n for some integer and then you take some de derivative if you can do an analytic continuation in n now this sounds like a, a trickery because you are doing some analytic continuation in n but there is a theorem called carlson's theorem it's a bit like it's not unlike uh, if you know that the function is analytic and if you know it's all these derivatives at a point which are some discrete data you know the first derivative second derivative then you can write down the function analytic function for all values as well in the domain of analysis it's, it's a bit similar to that there is a carlson's theorem which tells you that under certain growth conditions if you know the function at some discrete values then you know it in the entire way up to some analytic assumptions so therefore, it's not a, a totally crazy thing to do. This has been used. This is related. Uh, this is the Euclidean calculation that we are doing, but it is related in the Lorentzian picture to basically doing a Rindler calculation, where the Rindler observer on the right hand side does not see the left hand side, very much like a black hole outside does not see the inside of the black hole. And tracing over this, now it's clear why the entropy is divergent, because the Rindler temperature diverges as you approach the horizon. And if you just calculate the uh, entropy of the thermal heat bath, you get exactly this area on area dimensions. Okay, this I will explain in more in November. Okay, so the point is that how come we got a dimension for a physical quantity in the quantum field theory, which you cannot renormalize away? It's because you're asking the wrong question. And so that's why I think lately Witten has been writing a lot of papers on algebraic quantum field theory and so on. Uh, there is a certain advantage in dealing with algebraic quantum field theory. And the, I mean, many people have been interested in algebraic quantum field theory, and it goes back also to Wall's uh, proof of uh, Bekenstein, uh, sorry, the, the Bekenstein bound, which was proven by Kazimian, uh, or the proof of the generalized second law by Wall. And many recent papers by Witten and collaborators about how to define uh, this uh, certain notions of algebraic quantum field theory in the gravitational context. And the advantage of the algebraic quantum field theory is that instead of thinking in terms of Hilbert spaces and states, we think in terms of observables, in terms of operators. And the main point is that you cannot actually think of the Hilbert space of a quantum field theory as being factorized between the left and the right because there are very strong correlations. Like, for example, you have a, in the kinetic term, you have grad pi term. And if you discretize it, you are coupling the left and the right. And if, if you have some boundary, if you have a wall, and you're tracing over the left and the right, the degree of freedom here is very highly correlated with degree of freedom because of this term. If this is up, this has to be up and not down, things like that. So that's the main reason why you get this divergence, which is area divergence. And therefore, you cannot really factorize the Hilbert space, but the algebra of local observables is nevertheless factorized. You can see that uh, A left and A right commute, you could say. So this algebra quantum field theory allows you to define notions of entropy, the relative entropy, using just this algebra of observables, the common non algebras of observables. And then in that context, uh, whether or not you have a divergence gets translated into what is the uh, type of algebra that you're dealing with. So there are different types of algebra. There is a type one algebra or type three algebra. And the quantum mechanical case is the type one algebra. And the one defining feature of type one algebra is that it admits that the algebra of observables and irreducible representation. So for example, in the, this bell pair example, there is an irreducible representation of states, the operators which are acting only on the right, namely the Hilbert space of the right variables. In quantum field theory, there is no irreducible representation. 
of local fields which are local in uh, in the right regular way because if you could do that by Schur's lemma they would be just equal to identity they are commuting with everything on a left so therefore uh, in quantum field theory this is not possible and that's the basically the origin of this uh, divergence but you can define something called the relative entropy and this has come to play a very important role uh, in two recent interesting developments one is the proof by Cassini of the positive uh, of Bekenstein bound, which requires, uses this fundamental fact about relative entropy that is positive. And a very beautiful and important proof by Wall of the second law of generalized second law of thermodynamics, that the, which uses this monotonical monotonicity of the relative entropy under inclusion. However, uh, it also appears, for example, in all these paradoxes of firewall and what I would call the strong subadditivity paradox. Uh, so this entropy is really important in many different contexts. And for example, in Wall's proof of the second law of thermodynamics, even though you start talk this uh, use relative entropy as a defining concept, which is like a difference in a, in a way, which is free of divergences. In his proof, he has to sort of separate it into two terms as an energy term and an ent uh, entropy term. And the energy term you use this rice of equation to you know, manipulate it and to, uh, to prove the second law of thermodynamics, which in, by itself is diverse to, to begin with. So I think I just want to give you a motivation that it is important to be able to define a proper notion of a UV finite quantity for in many of these interesting concepts in, in the context. And the way you, one can do it is uh, this I had, this is a paper which really goes back to, I don't know, prehistoric days, I'm strong, uh, from my childhood. But um, basically, in string theory, it's very difficult to consider this n seated Riemann. You cannot make sense of string theory on this n cover of the plane. However, you can, string theory orbitals are very well defined. So this has kind of an opening angle 2 pi n, where n is an integer. Whereas here, it's in a code, the, the angle is 2 pi over n. With n is n, this, this capital n is n. So you can see that basically n is like 1 upon n. So instead of analytically continuing from n integer, we may try to analytically continue from capital N integer. So this was the attack that I had taken. And the reason being that the orbifolds are very easy to construct in string theory. And there is a very different procedure, and they always give a final answer. And UV divergence is guaranteed. So I was hoping that, okay, then you can just calculate it and you know. But of course, life is not so simple. So it's Straightforward to construct this orbifold and you get some partition function. If you can evaluate that partition function, you can get the entropy. But you find the sphere. Huh? sphere. So I have a, uh, uh, I, I also did the sphere partition. I have a different set of arguments the uh, using the tachyon for the, uh, for the sphere mm -hmm. as well. And that's actually quite important because there uh, I use the Gibbons knocking term, even though there is no black hole. Uh, so I think it's, in my opinion, it is actually in a way quite a, it's a very nice fundamental way to define entanglement of the string theory, including the three levels. Yeah, of, of, of this classes. Although one cannot really understand its microscopic origin, mm -hmm. but you can define it in the same way. Okay, we can come to that. Yeah. But the main difficulty is that uh, even though there is, so let me just explain this. In string theory, as you know, at one loop, you're, this is like a Schwinger parameter. The tau you can think of as a Schwinger parameter, right? So if you're computing, say, some uh, quantity like uh, heat comes into the minus p square plus m square. It's a trace, right? So trace of the heat comes. So from the momentum integral, so you get some power from ds over s to the power d minus one by two or something like that. And clearly, s going to zero 
is where the UV divergence is happening. That's where the momentum is. Uh, the, the UV divergence of the momentum integral corresponds to S going to zero. So basically, S is the finger parameter, the proper time. Proper time will becoming very small is the UV divergence. But in string theory, as we know, because of modular invariance, this region is excluded. So you are fine, fine in the UV. But this orbifold turns out to have a lot of uh, uh, tachyons in the spectrum. And they therefore lead to infrared divergence. So therefore, I sort of abandoned this approach and I didn't know what to do with it. But then recently, uh, Witten sort of got interested in this in, in this old paper of mine. And then he, uh, instead of analytically continuing the closed string problem, he solved the simpler problem of open strings under the inner coil. And he was able to find a very nice analytic continuation. Okay, the point is that uh, he also made this very interesting observation that uh, the fact that you have tachyonic divergences should not be necessarily a cause for despair because <clears throat> let's look at what we are trying to compute. We are trying to compute trace rho to the power s. Now, uh, this is the Rayleigh entropy. This is related to the Rayleigh entropy. Now, suppose you have a quantum mechanical system where trace rho is one. Then clearly, rho is, it could be infinite dimensional, but rho is some matrix appropriately regularized with entries which are less than one because this trace is equal to one. And therefore, if you take rho to the power any positive power, a square or cube, this is going to be convergent. So this is going to be a very nice analytic function for all real and greater than or equal to one. So therefore, for uh, zero real n, it should be greater than. Is that what I want to say? I'm sorry. I'm very wrong. And then I'm going to put it But since n is equal to one upon n, this corresponds to zero less than n less than zero. So in this regime, we expect this to be very fine. But of course, if you took the square root of rho, then it can happen that if even if the small numbers, uh, if you take the large you know, square root, they can add up to infinity. So even though trace root to the power n is well defined, trace root to the power one upon n doesn't have to be well defined. And we then therefore to the optimistic view that maybe the patterning divergences are indicating that this quantity is not well defined. And he went ahead and did the analytic continuation of the analysis diagram, the partition function for the open strings. And by looking at it in the closed string channel, and after doing it, so he was able to find a very nice non trivial analytic continuation and was able to find, show that uh, there are no. Even though for n less than one, or let me call it n capital n greater than one, there are tachyons in the flow string channel. After analytic continuing, for n less than or equal to one, there are no tachyons. So it, it was consistent with this intuition that trace rho to the power positive n, sorry, n integer n greater than one could be well defined, but n less than one may not be. Defined. Now, the problem for closed strings is much harder. And is that effectively going to the multi sheet cover? Huh? Sorry, I got lost. Is it, that sort of sounds like effectively going to the multi sheet cover. Yeah, effectively going to the multi sheet cover without uh, going to the multi sheet cover. <laughs> Meaning, uh, therefore, you're not constructing the entire string theory for the multi sheet cover, but you're only constructing the analytic intuition of the partition function, which may not have a state interpretation. Uh, so this problem remains open, and for closed strings, uh, it's much harder. It's, uh, by an order of magnitude, uh, and we struggled with it. But we made this following very interesting, I think, an, an observation that even though the partition function we were not able to analytically continue, we just look at the tachyonic divergent terms, and it turns out that the tachyonic divergent terms have this particular form. Okay, for a, a, a Zn orbifold where fk is this function, okay? And therefore, you can actually write it, you can resum it, and you write it like this. 
And now you can say that when n is less than one, alpha r is a positive quantity. Even though this function diverges as tau two goes, to, tau two is going to the planet. Even though this diverges when n is greater than one, it is perfectly finite when n is less than one or equal to one. And this, I think, is quite striking because it uh, depends. It's not just something random. Actually, it depends on three very just so properties of this orbital. Without those properties, you would not have found it. And it depends on this, these three factors. There are exactly n minus one twisted sectors. If there were n plus one twisted sector, this would not have worked. In the k twisted sector, the, there is precisely one leading tachyon and whose mass squared is linear in k. And there are many subleading tachyons, but they also have unit multiplicity. It's because of these three factors, these three facts, we are able to find this very nice analytic continuation. If this did not work, it would not work. So we actually went ahead uh, and checked that we constructed some other orbifolds uh, in Ankalabia manifolds, where there could be some additional tachyons. And we find in all such cases, this feature consists, persists. So it looks like some general feature of uh, string theory that just wants to tell you that uh, the tachyons will disappear if you do the analytic contribution properly. But I, I will not, at the moment, I don't have a complete proof of it. So I think there is good evidence, I think, uh, both from Witten's calculation in open string and our observation that the entanglement entropy computed using this orbifold method, which you can think of as a stringy analog of the replica method, is finite and calculable. And it, therefore, it continues to hold also for Calabria complex computations. And I think, therefore, it could be very interesting for all these explorations of quantum information theory and string theory. Okay, I'll stop here. I told him that I have to do the talk until you come. <laughs> so, thanks very much, Atish. Are there any questions? How far away are you from getting the answer? Just in the case. No, so we can do the calculation numerically now, but I think we don't have a. So, Witten had a very nice, uh, elegant analytic continuation of the open field of results. It's an actual function. Can I run a function? Which is uh, which is automatically continued to end gives you the answer. I think something similar could exist for close string thing, but we have not been able to do it. But we can do this trick and we can take part of the answer and analytically continue uh, uh, analytically. And the remaining part is a finite integral, so you can just evaluate it, and which we have done, and we plot it and we get a smooth curve. I mean, so, but it's not a uh, I would prefer to have an answer. Which is given in terms of some modular objects. Actually, we have been collaborating with Don's idea about this, and we have some partial results which look interesting, but I don't know. And mathematicians have methods for evaluating modular integrals which are well behaved, but these are outside of that class. Those twisted sector tachyons, microscopic if they are unstable, so you would expect them to condense. Are you saying that if you find analytic continuation for them, they'll be like able, like equivalent to condensing them after? So because, because they disappear from the spec, which is what we mean. Yeah, so I think one could take up, uh, I mean, when I wrote this paper a long time ago, uh, which I don't want to name how many years ago it was, it was in 1996, I think. Uh, I didn't. Uh, yeah, one could make this kind of speculation of tachyon condensation. It's a bit like uh, Apic Witten's uh, story. But here, the point of view I would like to take is that you just uh, do, uh, just treat it as a data for a replica trick. And you just do analytic continuation of the, without trying to necessarily interpret them. Uh, I mean, that's uh, both points of view are fine. But here, my point of view is that I just want to use it as a data for computing of function mm -hmm. uh, in the physical domain, which is in less than or equal to one. So, do you expect, for instance, to return to be able to reproduce the logarithmic area correction of n equals to eight rules technique? 
So the relation between entanglement and entropy. Okay, so first of all, I'm doing it for our inverse space. So it's really the area has gone to infinity. I'm taking a black hole whose area has gone to infinity. So it really looks like a plane and not S, S D minus two. Uh, these calculations can be extended to the black hole horizons also. We are working on that. Um, yeah. In, I don't know the relation between entanglement entropy and black hole entropy. I mean, so I don't have a settled view on this. I really, it, okay, currently, I, I think that entanglement entropy in some ways could be more fundamental than the black hole. In that, you take any region and you trace over the degrees of freedom inside, you get it's proportional to area. And black hole is a special case where you are tracing over the degrees of freedom of black hole. This is one point of view. So, I mean, in the same sense that fundamental entropy in quantum field theory is a fundamental quantity. And if one can define some analog of that in string theory, uh, it could be more. Uh, that could be the more basic object than the black hole. Because if, in my discussion, I didn't, there was no black hole. I could trace over the left of this room. It's kind of related to the black holes, but it's not necessarily related to the black holes. So, yeah, the two things are related, but I don't know what way. Just a random question, of course. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you mentioned there will be integrals over modular forms. Which are not of the usual kind. Does it mean they are not eta integrals, or do you can you say? Well, this is random. Yeah, yeah. Maybe no, we should so, so play. Yeah, yeah. Basically, uh, if you see, suppose uh, you take an integral over the fundamental domain. So, right. Of let's say the Ramanujan function, right? Delta tau to square. Mm -hmm. This is very well behaved, both at the IR and the UD. But what you encounter in string theory. It's more like this. So this is a cusp form that vanishes at infinity. Right. And so if it comes to the denominator, there is a tachyonic divergence. So therefore, this integral is not well defined. It has a tachyonic divergence. And you sort of regular. Uh, so uh, we can analytically continue to infinity. Uh, no, no. So in our problem, what happens is that this function depends on n. What we find is that the tachyonic divergence can be analytically continuous on this finite if you take n to be in the physical domain. But we don't know how to do the analytic continuous with the entire point. If you could do that, then that would be the method to calculate it. That's it's quite hard. But is Fn you know in a finite domain? I mean... Yeah, Fn you know, for example, it is given by, in the simplest case, it's actually given by the y stress wave functions. And it's like something like this. Comes over case k tau plus n is over n. And that is your n. Yeah, that's your yes, yeah, that's your n. Well, thank you. <laughs> so it's it's a completely explicitly non-modular function, but it has tachyonic divergence. So you don't know how to do the modular. But we claim that. N greater than one is not a physical region. So it is conceivable that if you can do the analytic condition of this function to the n less than or equal to one, then, then you would you could get a normal integral, then you can just do it. But that is difficult. But we what we are able to do is that we split this into the diver exponentially growing part and exponential non-growing part. And we showed that the exponentially growing part has a nice integral. And so then you do numerically. Uh, that you can do analytically explicitly. But you said that the end. And the remaining part, the remainder we can do numerically. So it's it's a little bit of a uh, uns I mean, unsatisfactory butchering of the nice modular form. And not each of the form has nice transformation. Yeah, and they're not each other form the this, but I think it's strongly indicated that there is some nice feature in this space. Thank you.